If you have your Bibles tonight, we're going to complete the series in 1 John. And if you will, turn to 1 John 4, 10 and 11. 1 John 4, 10 and 11. We've had a good series uh, in 1 John. Uh, some of the themes we see, of course, are the love of God and love for our fellow uh, Christian. And we've taken up the themes of abiding and bearing fruit. And as uh, they used to tell us in school, uh, bear, uh, some of this will come up in a test, so be prepared for it. I'm not going to give you a test. But you could hear uh, some of this again very soon because it's very important there about abiding in Christ and bearing fruit. But 1 John 4, 10 and 11, <clears throat> Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. We see uh, John, the, the disciple of love, the beloved disciple here, uh, saw himself as he was uh, personally intimate there uh, with the Lord Jesus. He was uh, one of the three closest disciples there uh, to our Lord. He sat at his feet. Uh, there and heard his teaching and saw the great and mighty miracles that he performed. And he considered himself uh, as the recipient of Christ's love. And tonight, we're all the recipients of Christ's love. That's why he went to the cross. That is the why. Uh, because he first loved us. And as John says, in his gospel, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever uh, believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now that was the why. Tonight we're going to uh, uh, consider the how, and that is the propitiation. He couldn't just love us uh, for us to be saved. Love couldn't do it. Because God is holy and is righteous. And that would have compromised that. So there had to be a way. And the way was the propitiation there uh, through Jesus. He called for believers to love one another. He's addressing some very practical uh, points. Uh, as they had, uh, he, he goes into... Uh, uh, there was the Gnosticism there uh, in the Greek Gnosis. That was a heresy in that day. And he talks a lot about false teachers and uh, Antichrist. And we know that we have seen many Antichrists with a little A uh, here for, uh, I don't know, for 50, 75 years. We thought, uh, they thought during World War II that Hitler and Mussolini and Stalin were all the Antichrist. Well, they were, I guess you could say, the little. But the main Antichrist is yet to come, we see, where the church will be raptured. Another theme that John has addressed in the epistle is he refused to love the world or the things of the world. And he says, if you love the things of the world, but love the world and the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in you. So, uh, it's, uh, it's a, uh, uh, a happy balance, I guess, you could say, in the Christian life. Uh, there, we're in the world, obviously, and we have to uh, do so much with the world, but we're not to love the world. You know, this world is, is not our home. We do have a better world, a better place coming. Uh, we see that John reveals the reach and rationale for love in the Christian life. And there is a reach and a, and a rationale. God, first of all, God loved us first. God so loved the world. I often wonder why God would fool with us. There 
there in Eden. He could have, uh, after Adam and Eve said, he could have cleansed the whole lot of Adam's race upon the earth there. He could have got rid of Adam and Eve and he still would have been a holy, righteous God. Why then did he, why then did he go on and fool with us? After, and he can see, you know, far enough ahead to know what the consequences would be. I'll tell you why. Because he loved us. God so loved the world. God loves us all. And that's certainly true. God loves the whole world. God loves the most evil, rotten sinner in the whole world. And that's why he sent his son into the world to die for our sins. You know, we have not sought God. Romans 3.11, there is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. We don't naturally seek God to be saved. I didn't. Now, God saw me. I was a little boy in this church. I was about 12 years old, maybe a little younger. I remember Frank Ellis had come up and uh, had done a revival and he taught the tabernacle here at one time and uh, during his preaching, I came under the conviction that I needed to be saved. Well, finally at age 14, when we were living up there at the farm, I did. There in my room one Sunday afternoon, I asked Jesus into my heart. I knew even then that if he came, and that was 1978, that I would be left. I would be lost. So I accepted him. And uh, certainly, I have failed him many times. I've tried to do what is right, I've tried to live according to his word, but many times I have failed. He seeks us first. What Calvin calls total depravity. There's five points of Calvinism. Total depravity. In other words, I was so depraved that you were so depraved that so far down in the pit of sin that we naturally would not ask God or Jesus to come to save us. He would take the initiative. Uh, you know, I just did decide one day to choose Jesus Christ or to be saved. He came and, and, and spoke to my heart in the Holy Spirit and, and uh, uh, said, Greg, you need to be saved. But I naturally did not seek him. God is the original seeker. Now he's going to he's going to woo us, try to woo us, as they say, to be saved. But he's not going to overcome our free will. You know, we have free will to accept or reject Jesus. Now, a lot of people say, well, we don't have that free will. God formates or determines from, some say even before the time, who would be saved and who would be lost. I don't believe that. Finally, seeking God is but responding to His love. The greatest love that has ever been. The agape love there. God loved us from the foundation of the world. First of all, we are chosen in Him. Ephesians 1, 4, For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. He chose uh, for uh, us to, if God can't, you know, save us if we don't want to be saved. Uh, but yet, we have the choice. That's what is called election. We're elected there, we who accept Jesus are elected and we go into the kingdom of God. But we're chosen in Him. Redemption was planned, we see in 1 Peter 1, 18 through 20, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, the lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen from the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. That is our redemption. We're not uh, redeemed with silver or gold, but with the blood 
of Jesus Christ. The blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Paschal Lamb. You go back to the uh, Hebrew uh, sacrificial system and they would sacrifice that lamb there. The, the, holy, the high priest would go there <coughs> into the Holy of Holies uh, one day a year and take that sacrifice, offer it on the altar there. The Jews call it Yom Kippur. And the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate Lamb of God, was uh, chosen from before the creation of the world, but revealed in these last times for your sake. You go read the, you go study and read the entire book of Hebrews. You'll find that's the theme of it. Uh, the Jews, the writer, whoever it was, I believe it was Paul, others say it was somebody else, we don't know. We can speculate, speculate. <laughs> But the writer, whoever wrote it, was writing with the express purpose to the Jews who were still going back to the old sacrificial system, still bringing sacrifices. And the writer says you don't have to do that anymore. It's all been taken care of. One time on the cross, God took care of it through the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus. Now, Beforehand, they had to break the sacrifices every week at the, at the, oh, at the uh, Yom Kippur every year. And, and, and they, they, uh, they were only a proxy, if you will. But Jesus paid it all. And it never has to be done again. We see secondly there in verse 10, what love spent. We see here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. The propitiation of our sins. What is the propitiation? <coughs> it refers to the death of Christ on the cross. Now, propitiation demanded full payment for our sins. God loved us. He didn't want to see us die or perish. But there had to be a price paid. No free lunches in life. Everything costs. Even our redemption costs the Son of God. The precious, sinless Son of God. Cost of his life. No free lunches, as we say. But he did so freely. Jesus paid that price for propitiation. Isaiah 53, 5 and 6, For he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was won by him, and by his wounds or stripes we are healed. We're all like sheep who have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The, 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 the darkest hour, the darkest time for our Lord was when the entire weight of all sin of Adam's race was laid there upon his shoulders and it was black and dark. And the ultimate hurt to Jesus was when the Father turned his back there on his own son he could not look there upon human sin. He was pierced for our transgressions. And we're like sheep. We turn away. We go our own way. We have to be knocked on the head with a staff, as it were, and brought back. But God has laid on him, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Propitiation was God settling her sin problem. Now up until the time of Calvary, to the Jew, uh, they had to break the sacrifices, the animal sacrifices, uh, there to the altar, there to the synagogue, weekly. I'm glad we don't have to do that anymore. Wouldn't be too many animals left if we had to do that. Especially me. 
H. A. Ironside said about propitiation. In those hours of darkness, God was dealing with his son about that awful question. And there he bore in his inmost soul the judgment that you and I would have to bear ourselves for all eternity if left without a Savior. Thus he became a propitiation. Now, he could have come down off of that cross very easily. He could have said to heck with it. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of the humiliation. I'm tired of the pain. He could have called 10,000 angels. But he knew, just like Ironside said there, he knew we'd be lost for all eternity. And his love overpowered the, any human feelings that he had. And, and, and more importantly, the Father's will was that he died. And he even begged there at Gethsemane if there was another way that this cup could pass. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thou would be done. Thirdly, we see where love sins. In verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we are also to love one another. You know, receiving love brings responsibility. God loves us, and we're therefore to love one another. We just can't hold that love within us. We need to share it. And there's a lot of ways we can share it uh, today to love one another. That's the secret there of a church in the will of God, loving one another. You know, if you hate your brother and your sister in the church, and you're out of fellowship. It's a bad thing. But if, we're, if we have the, the love of God flowing through us, and if we're right with Him, I don't believe we can help to share it with one another. We're sent to all believers with love. Uh, this love goes beyond words. We certainly can't describe it, especially the love of God. We're to love indeed in truth. It should be exhibited, should be demonstrated. This love produces compassion for those in need. It's easy to shut up, as it were, the bowels of mercy. But the love there that the Father has for us has to be shared with one another. God's love also sends us to sinners with the gospel. Well, if you think... Your Lord today because he loves you. How many of us have ever said that in our prayers? I don't know that I've ever said that. We should do that. Have you received Christ, the gift of his love, and are you carrying God's love to others? So we complete the series in 1 John, God's great circle of love. 